fathers specifically, okay? So just bow your heads. Lord, we just thank you for today, Lord. Lord, we thank you that you give us the opportunity to be dads, Lord. Lord, it's easy to become a dad, but it's not as easy to be a good father. And Lord, we need your strength and your wisdom to guide us in how to be a good father, Lord. Because Lord, we will trip up along the way, but Lord, your hand is there to pick us up and brush us off and hug us tight and say, just keep following me, son. And you will be a good father in my eyes and the sight of your children. And we just thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Miss Janice, I expect to see you Wednesday, Sunday, Wednesday, Sunday, Wednesday, Sunday. Sing for us. <laughs> that's my kind of stuff. I'm glad that strap was on the chair holding me down. <laughs> If you can on the uh, screen, let's put up James 1.27 because, you know, we're fathers and we have our, our families, our children to raise. And we go through life doing what we're supposed to do for the kids and the, and the household and the wife. But then there's also in the word here, and I'll let them get a chance to get that up there. James 1.27. We'll go ahead and start into it. If they get it up there, that'll be fine. James 1.27, external religious worship, religion as it is expressed in outward acts, that is pure and unblemished in the sight of God the Father, is this. To visit and help and care for the orphans and widows in their affliction and need, and to keep oneself unspotted and uncontaminated from the world. See, sometimes we think it's just about mine. But what's a good father? He cares about all the children. Not just his own and just who's immediately around him. So I want fathers to keep that in your hearts to know, hey, there's someone over here who's fatherless. There's someone over here who they may have a dad, but dad's in and out. And any chance I can to just stand in the gap. All right? We're not trying to be their dad, but just standing in the gap for a moment. Because so many, even though they may not be fatherless inside their hearts, they feel fatherless. Because dad ain't, dad ain't quite there. And that's not condemnation, but that's just where people are in their lives sometimes. So we want to keep that in mind as fathers about what, you know, if you want to know how to be a good father and what being a good father is, just read the Bible. It's all in there. It's full of it. And remember, when there's one finger pointing at you, like Pastor Bob says, there's three back at me. So I'm speaking today not to y'all, to me. I'm speaking to me and to y'all. So I keep all this in my own heart because Rachel will tell you I mess up a lot. <laughs> but that's, that's, the, that's the form we're in currently, Right? One day in a glorified body, we'll be a glorified daddy. All right? There won't be no goof-ups anymore, right? Absolutely. So we'll get it going there. So now what I want to lead into is talking a little bit. This is kind of a medley. And I wanted to tell the fathers, if you don't have it, rent it. But pull out the movie Courageous. And if you can, watch that tonight. Because that is such a blessing and such a very good, I mean, an edifying movie to dads. Yes, it is. Even if you think, hey, man, I got all this right, right, just watch the movie. Because I mean, right when you think you got it all right, whoops, right. trip me up, something trip me up. So just watch that tonight and keep in mind, Lord, build me up. Strengthen me as a dad. And I encourage that movie just, just to watch it. So what we're going to talk about for a minute is conviction. Now, conviction, I've got two little definitions of it. A firmly held belief or opinion. Firmly, 
a firm belief. All right, when you get convicted of something, it's a firm belief. And then it's the quality of showing that one is firmly convinced of what one believes or says. Now, sometimes the taming of the tongue gets tongue twisted, doesn't it? Because sometimes we say things, but yet in our heart, we ain't truly convinced or believe it. Or we say things that we think we're convinced of that the world has put in us and we spit it out there to the people. And they all wandering around with all these different messages and words and and how to be a a dad or just to walk through life. And they get they get uh, tripped up with it. So it's a firm belief, firmly convinced of what one believes or says. Let me give you an example. A legal opinion. Okay, a legal opinion is based off what facts are presented. You got it? In other words, you come into my court and you come and you present your case. I'm judging on that presentation of evidence. Not judging on things I know. I'm judging on what you're presenting to me. And I got to render a legal opinion. Okay? Catch me. Hold on now. So, when I go out, okay, and I spew out what I believe, what I think to know, I'm presenting my system of belief or my opinion or what I'm firmly convinced of. Now, the world wants you to take out a book and they want you to read the first two and a half pages. Then they want you to read the last two pages. They don't want you to know all the stuff in the middle. You see what I'm saying? They want you to get a little glimpse, but they don't want you to really know what's in the middle. Because see, if you're in the middle, you'll become firmly convinced of what the whole book says. Got me, Pastor Bob? But if you just get a tinge of the front and a tinge of the back, you ain't convinced of nothing. But you walk around like you know it. I know that I know that I know. Although I didn't read it, read it, read it. And we get tripped up along the way. So what are you firmly convinced of? You know, what are you, what are you basing your legal opinion on? If you don't present evidence to yourself, how are you going to render a verdict? If you don't get something in you that you can meditate on and, le- and learn and rely and depend on, how are you going to be convinced of it? I don't want you to just tell me the chicken is good. I want to go eat some of the chicken and then I'm going to tell you whether I thought it was good or not. <laughs> Fried chicken, of course. <laughs> so that's where we are. Now, listen, here's the thing where people get mixed up a little bit. Pastor Bob has taught on this years and years. My convictions don't have to be your convictions, and your convictions don't have to be my convictions. Because, see, we're all at a different stage in this life. We're all at different levels. There's things as a pastor he can't even touch. Not that they're morally wrong or anything, but there's just some things in his life he stays clear of. Not because he can't do it, because he has, in his position, he has to stay clear. God works through him in a different way than it works through Rachel or me or Miss Rose. Or any of us. So my convictions aren't your convictions. Your convictions aren't my convictions. But here's the difference. As we all grow and mature as Christians, most of our convictions should line up. You understand now? That's not force feeding you to believe my convictions. That's just saying as we grow and mature as Christians, most of our convictions should line up. Why is that? Because the word is truth, and truth is the word. And if you want to know the truth, get on past page two and a half, and get on through the whole thing, and understand and read, and meditate on the truth. If someone comes up to you and says, well, you know, I I believe in God, but I don't know about all this Jesus stuff. 
Is that going to sway you? Now, if you only read the first two pages, you might be swayed. Because see, the world, again, wants you to note a couple pages on the front and a couple on the back. Because then they got you fooled. It's like the news. Boop, here's a little bit. And we're going to go into the next story. We're not going to tell you the whole story. We're just going to shoot. And then we're going to the next story. We'll leave it up to you to find out the truth. So we don't want to be sheep just wandering out there, never knowing where to go, right? We want to f- look at my, my pastor's over there. I'm Because, see, I know he knows where he's going. And if I'm at a little lost, I'm going to go find him and follow him. And as a good pastor, he looks out there. Man, what are my sheep doing way out there? Woo! I done told them. The pastor goes and gets his sheep and brings them back in. It's like he's saying, if you want to know how to walk and live this life, come here as often as you possibly can. Not to fill a quota, not to check off your name in the checkbook, but to put something in you. Right? He can't use an empty vessel. An empty vessel is full of nothing but air. But when you pour into that vessel, then that's appetizing to somebody. See, if it's an empty vessel and I'm thirsty, that vessel don't mean nothing. But if I know that vessel's got water in it and I'm thirsty, I'm going to go get me some water. You see what I'm saying? I'm convinced of that. When people are filled with the water, with the word, they have something for you. They are ready to help minister to you. Now, if they go with the world system, careful who you follow. Careful who you're walking with. All right? Conviction. If I, I'll give a true life example. Me and my buddy, growing up, you know, fine, we... Had a ball together, Pastor Bob. But I wanted to be on the right side of some stuff, and he wanted to be on the left side. So at some point, someone's going to win that battle. See, it was a battle, and you don't even know it's a battle. But too many times we go, well, you know, it's my friend. I'm just going to overlook. I'm going to overlook that. And I'm going to let my conviction is actually going to be his conviction. He's not convicted of the things I'm convicted of because I'm convicted that the Bible is 100% accurate. But he don't know nothing about the accuracy of the Bible. So which way, what's going to happen? At some point, you just got to keep on splitting apart. And that's hard to do. It's hard. Exactly right. And so it's hard. But I can't make him become convicted of my convictions see I can share I can minister but at some point whoever you're doing that to their heart has to open up they have to be convicted of of the truth you know a bottle of pills has no influence on you unless you take the bottle of pills open it and swallow them down your throat then it has influence on you. So what are you letting influence you? What are you going to be convicted of? You might not walk around saying I'm convinced or convicted or I firmly believe, but your actions will surely show what you believe. Your actions will dictate. And people are, remember, they hear you a little bit, but they see you all the time. Right, Pastor Bob? (laughs) They hear you just a little bit, but they see you every time their eyes are on you. You speak volumes by your actions. And just like this tongue trips us up, our actions trip up. We're walking around again in this imperfect body for now. So, conviction. Fathers convicting, convicted of I need to be doing this 
versus this. I need to have love versus hatred. I need to have some compassion versus complaining. I need to see it's a balancing act. And we're always balancing. Because every day is different. Every moment's different. It's going great right now, but give it about a half a minute. And something can go bad. So we're always balancing. That's again, you know, you don't want to be too far left, you don't want to be too far right. You want to be right in the middle of that road, right, Pastor Bob? You want to balance right in there. Because just like he was talking about this morning with Paul, Paul, and then the little thorn in the flesh. Woo! Um, maybe I should balance myself out a little bit. Not think too lowly, not think I'm being punished. But the Lord's got his thumb on me. He's wanting me to keep straight. Narrow path. Okay? So conviction. Not my convictions. I don't want your convictions. But a lot of our convictions should line up as mature Christians. That's where we should be. That's that unity. You know, you talk about unity. I'm talking about life. Life. What you're doing. Your actions. Not just that we're here and we're in one accord. We all believe the same thing here, I hope. But all our actions outside of here lining up to one accord. Unity. Would you be ashamed of my actions if you saw me out there? Would I be ashamed of your actions if I saw you out there? Huh? Right? And again, we all mess up. But now if we start seeing, like Pastor Bob says, a pattern, then we got to go fishing for that brother or sister. We can't leave them out there. You got to catch them and bring them back a little bit. Right? Amen. Amen. So, if you would put up Mark 9, 43. Matthew 9, 43. I'm sorry, Mark, Mark, Mark. I'm still on the song, Janice, sorry, I'm all messed up still. (laughs) Mark 9, 43 through 49. Now we're talking about conviction, right? You ready for some of this? And if your hand puts a stumbling block before you and causes you to sin, cut it off. Mm -hmm. It's more profitable and wholesome for you to go into that, into life that is really worthwhile, maimed, than with two hands to go to hell, into the fire that cannot be put out. 45. And then if your foot is a cause of stumbling and sin to you, cut it off. It is more profitable and wholesome for you to enter into life that is really worthwhile, crippled, than having two feet to be cast into hell. Number 47. If your eye causes you to stumble and sin, pluck it out. It is more profitable and wholesome for you to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into hell. Some serious stuff, isn't it? (laughs) Number 48. Where they're warm, which which preys on the inhabitants and is a symbol of the wounds inflicted on the man himself by his sins, does not die, and the fire is not put out. 49. For everyone shall be salted with fire. Everyone's going to go through the test, huh, Pastor Bob? So, those are some pretty harsh scriptures. I mean, hand cut it off and pluck out my eye. We're not taking that literal. But we sometimes should think about it that way because that's how serious it is. See, that sounds harsh, but it really is harsh. Because see, the end result of all that nonsense that we get ourselves into because of this flesh leads to some harsh 
reality. Even if you're saved and, and you're not going to hell, you're still going to deal with some harsh realities in your life. Because you will not get convicted, convinced, firmly believe in a certain area that if you don't stop that nonsense, it's going to give me a harsh reality. And we're going to put ourselves through a harsh time and a harsh emotion and a harsh lifestyle. It'll just keep going just like around that mountain, around that mountain until you cut it off. Just like that friendship I was in it. I had to finally look at that brother and say, we're done. Now, now, trust me, when you do that, you think the fight's over. It just begun. Amen. See, because when I did that, I became the problem. I was the problem. You got a problem. And I'm looking at him like, whoo. <laughs> but I let him go at it. Six years later, Six years later, the phone rang. Charles, I want to apologize. You were trying to help me, and I tried to hurt you. I was so wounded, I took your help as an offense, and I wanted to hurt you with it. That's good, now see, now if you ain't convinced and firmly believing where you are, me and him would have still been fighting right now. Twenty-some years later, we'd still be fighting. But because I was firmly planted and convinced, I'm not going to, st I'm going to stand, I'm not going to sway one way or the other on this thing. And the apology came, and the apology was accepted, and I told that man I loved him through all that six years of nonsense. Amen. But I could not push it, see? He wasn't ready. I wanted to call him every month of every year for those six years and do something, but I knew I had to stand. Sometimes it's time to stand. Just be quiet, put on all that armor and stand. Because if you go stoked in the fire, you're gonna get what, Willie? Bingo. So it wasn't for me to stoke the fire, it's for him to be convicted and convinced and, and, and let God work on him. Which, thank God, did. He became saved. He's living for God now. And I give all the praise to God for that. And that's real life stuff. And I, let me go back a little bit more. I thank God that he put something in me at an early age to stay out of some of that nonsense. I mean, I still get myself into some messes, but I don't get into a bunch of nonsense. I call it foolish. Who wants to be known as a foolish person? But who does foolish things? Now, put those two together, okay? If I don't want to be known as a foolish man, maybe I shouldn't do some of them foolish things I do sometimes. Bingo. You ain't got to be called foolish to know you being foolish. Let's put it that way. All right? So that's something we all work on. Now, let's go back to courageous for a minute. Dad, are you able to, would you able to get that up? Okay, that's all right. Jacob, Josh, pass those out while I'm talking for a minute. I printed out the resolution, which was from that movie. For the men. So give every dad, raise your hand who's a dad, and let the boys bring one to you. But I want to read something now. Who all saw Courageous? All right, and the rest, you know about the movie? Heard about it? Know anything? Well, it's a movie really centered around men starting to take their roles serious and do what they're supposed to. Now, who? Ma'am? Hand, put your hand up. Now, whoever saw the movie, did you think it was a good movie? All right, well, let me tell you what the world thinks about you people. <laughs> I, I was looking up the, uh, the resolution because I wanted to print it out, and I saw this critic page, who liked the movie, who didn't like the movie. Now, out of all critics... 
only 30% gave the movie an okay. 30%. Now, out of the people who saw the movie, who really went with an open heart and open mind to watch the movie, 86% liked the movie. That's a big gap. Let me go a little further now. Let's get to the Pharisees part. The top critics, the top professional critics in their field, only 13% liked the movie. Remember page two and a half and page two in the back? That's them top critics. They thought it was dogmatic. It is dogmatic. You know, God's serious about his word. Amen. You know, those people putting them movies out, they're serious about spreading the gospel. Amen. So I'm glad they wrote that. So there's the 10% telling the 90% they don't know what he's talking about. Isn't that something? That just, what kind of sense is that? Now, I was, I'm a banker from, from trade. 10% overruling 90%, something's wrong with that. That ain't reality. That might look good on your little paper you're showing everybody, but that's not the truth. I say, and they say, that's not the truth, Ruth. <laughs> so, top critics, 13%. Ain't that a good number? 13%. Who thinks they really know what he's talking about? They just like the world system. Just like the news flash. If I throw that fiery dart, I know a few going to take it. You know what I'm saying? You get up in a bed of fish, Willie, you know you throw that worm out there, so one of them going to take it, right? Boom, got him. They, they are expecting you to be so naive and so caught up in the busyness of the world, they keep throwing that dart, and they know at some point you're going to let them stick into you. Because at some point, you're going to take your helmet off. You're going to take your breastplate off. You, uh, I, I was weak there for a minute, and I didn't know what happened, but now i got all these darts all up in me. I don't know what to do. And now I'm convinced like the world is. I'm convinced this is all, maybe the Bible's foolishness. Maybe, uh, maybe I'm not so convinced now that I'm, I'm, I'm a Christian. I'm starting to feel like I'm on the Titanic. I'm swaying. I don't know what's going on. But that full armament, when you're provided armament, it isn't to hang up in the shelf, on the closet. And, you know, it's made to put on. When they're making the armor, they're not making it going, you know what, we're going to box this up one day and we're going to sell it. No, they're expecting you to buy it and then put it on. Because see, armament is meant for armed. I'm armed and ready. Who wants to be standing there in an open field being shot out without their armor on? So every day, you have to do what? Just like you put your nap, your clothes on. You got to do what? I got to put my armor on. My spiritual armor has to come on. I mean, you got to almost feel like you actually putting on that metal. And nothing going to get to me today, God. I'm going to walk right through this fiery dark. See, they coming though. Don't think you're going to walk through and the darts aren't coming. Because you, you, mm, you mired in something disbelief there. See, the Bible tells you about the fiery darts. And if the Bible's true, then I know the fiery darts are coming, right, Pastor Bob? I'm truly convinced, no matter how good I would think I'm walking around here and how good and proper I am, I know the darts are coming. No matter how bad, no matter how good, them darts are coming. The darts are coming. He just wants to throw a few more at some of the good guys. Oh, there's a couple of people thinking they got it all good. Watch this. <laughs> Fiery. Rapid. Machine gun style darts. You think he ain't been hit with some darts? Hey, he trying to duck, walk through it. Go, Man, where's all these darts coming from? But then he says, well, wait a minute now. I'm more than a conqueror. These darts ain't affecting me. You walk through them, don't you, Pastor Bob? With God's help, he walks through all those fiery darts. Convinced of it. I will not die from the enemy's attack. I'm convinced of that. I'm convinced that this flesh that I was given will not inherit the kingdom. But my spirit's going to be married up to a new body. Woo! That's Pastor Bob. <laughs> That's what I'm convinced of. That's what I firmly believe. Firmly believe. 
I absolutely accept it as the whole truth. Now here's, not, now here's what the world wants you to do. Well, explain it to me. I can't explain it all, see? God imparts some wisdom to me, and there's some things he keeps to him. Because, see, I don't want to start thinking I'm God. See, you want to trip me up. I used to love, if you haven't seen some of the old interviews with Billy Graham, watch some of the interviews with Billy Graham. I'll tell you what I mean. These liberal talk show hosts would get him on there. It's all nice in the beginning. You know, he want a cookie, he wants some milk. And then they try to trip him up. What do you think about homosexuality? What do you think about, you know, this and that? They thought they were going to hit him with one of them darts, Pastor Bob. And he just always answered in love and in truth. Never got shaken, just steady. And you can, watch, you'll see this. Watch the demeanor of those, those uh, television people. You see them just, they can't handle it. And they, but they went in, I'm going to get him, I'm going to get him, I'm going to set him up and I'm going to trip him up. And then, psh, he didn't have to yell at him, he didn't scream, he didn't go nuts, he just gave him the word. Just quoted the scripture, just gave him the word. Not Billy Graham's idea, but Billy Graham's belief. Totally convinced that what he was putting out was God's word and it was truth. That's it. And when you're convinced of that, you can put it out with 100% confidence. 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 And let it go. Confidence. Because that's what we want to be, right? We want to walk around confident. Yes. Yes. Now that doesn't mean you're not, sometimes you're weak in the middle of the confidence. Mm -hmm. Okay? Sometimes you may be at your lowest, but our duty is to walk around high, okay? We don't slump over when the times are bad. Well, woe is me. I just, you know, going to let everyone see me in my woe is me state. And then they start, well, what's wrong with that dude? I thought he was always upbeat. What's wrong? wrong? He run over his dog or something? But see, they watching. What are you putting out there? What are you giving them, feeding them? And there's nothing wrong with having a moment, but you don't stay in your moments. That's right. That's good. You don't, you, when you get dirty, if you're working in it, you got to be in it for a minute. But then you get out and you go shower up, clean up, put on some fresh clothes. Mm -hmm. Don't try to stay dirty. My wife gets on me, you know, sometimes she thinks I'm a little been out there a little too long and dirty don't get in my bed dirty go take a shower <laughs> but i ain't dirty you dirty <laughs> not what i think what she thinks <laughs> talk about stinking thinking we talking about some other stinking huh pastor bob <laughs> So, here's what I want to lead into a little bit now. So we understand conviction, conviction, conviction. If you're not convicted of certain areas, don't, don't freak out. As God, as the Holy Spirit guides you and leads you and ministers to you, he'll show those areas. But the one thing you need to be firmly convinced of, if you're going to say you're a Christian, Get convinced that this is 100% true. The rest will come. If you can get that in your heart, in your being, the rest is coming. Okay? You got it made. You got it made. If you think this Bible is 100% true, you ain't got no problems. You got it made. You have circumstances and darts, but you got it made. You're going to inherit the kingdom. And that's a good thing. Now, I want to go in, let's read the resolution. You got it in front of you. And so this says, and to, to the men especially, but to everyone, this is good for everyone. But, but this was a movie about the men just going, I want to step up. 
So it says, I do solemnly resolve before God to take full responsibility for myself, my wife, and my children. I will love them, protect them, serve them, and teach them the word of God as spiritual leader of my home. I will be faithful to my wife to love and honor her and be willing to lay down my life for her as Jesus did for me. I will bless my children and teach them to love God with all their hearts, all their minds, and all their strength. I will train them to honor authority and live responsibly. I will confront evil, pursue justice, and love mercy. I will pray for others and treat them with kindness, respect, and compassion. I will work diligently to provide for the needs of my family. I will forgive those who wrong me and reconcile with those I have wronged. Well, that's a big one. I will learn from my mistakes, repent my, of my sins, and walk with integrity as a man answerable to God. I like that one. I will seek to honor God, be faithful to his church, obey his word, and do his will. I will courageously work with the strength God provides to fulfill this resolution for the rest of my life and his glory. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Joshua 24, 15. Now listen, that sounds good, doesn't it? And that's hard stuff. Even for the Christian who's been a Christian for 96 and a half years, that can still be some hard stuff. So as some of the infants that we are in some of our stages, it's doubly hard. But if you'll put it in here, if you'll embed it in your heart, like I said, it'll bubble out. It'll come bubbling up. It'll come bubbling up. But you got to speak it. You got to speak to yourself. You got to speak to yourself, right, Pastor Bob? Right. Sometimes you just got to talk to yourself. Sometimes you're all alone, right. and you just got to you got to edify yourself. Sometimes, you know, you look in the mirror. You want to get mad at the man in the mirror. Tomorrow, get up and look at the man in the mirror and say, "You a blessed man. Amen. You're more than a conqueror. Amen. You will not die from the enemy's attacks." So you got to speak to yourself. Sometimes no one's speaking to you. Sometimes you don't even hear God. That don't mean you shut up. You just start speaking to yourself. And God will... What's he saying down there? Oh, yeah. And then God starts doing a little bit of... Uh-huh. He starts... He gets into it a little bit. Because see, God's a happy God. You don't think God can dance, do you? God get down now. He can get down. All right? <laughs> Yes, sir. Hey, watch it now. I don't know if they can handle that, Willie. <laughs> they ain't ready for that today. <laughs> All right. Now, we've been talking about revival, okay? So I want to talk a little bit about that because it's like the, uh, one of the quotes I heard in one of the, the Christian movies, you know, when the two farmers who prayed for rain, they needed rain, but only one went out and prepared his fields. So if we're, if we're wanting revival, we got to get a little work going on, okay? You got to get a little, oh, we want revival. Do we want revival? Okay, we got to do some work then. Be prepared for revival, okay? So here's, I'm going to read some little quotes about revival, of what it is, it, revival, spiritual awakening. God's quickening visitation of his people, touching their hearts and deepening his work of grace in their lives. The sovereign act of God in which he restores his own backsliding people to repentance, faith, and obedience. Mm. See, sometimes people think of revival just to bring the sinners in. Ain't think we were talking about our own house. Ah. <laughs> First start the house of God. Bingo. Times are refreshing from the presence of the Lord. The awakening or quickening of God's people to their true nature and purpose. Mm, mm, I like that one too, Pastor Bob. The return of the church from her backslidings in the conversion of sinners. An extraordinary movement of the Holy Spirit producing extraordinary results. This is a good one here. A community saturated with God. Why are you trying to reach your communities? Because the world's reaching them. Trust me. 
You got to, you want to, look, and if you ain't going to touch your own community, how are you going to touch somebody else? You know, you think these, pe- these people that's got these big ministries started out with 16,000 people in the auditorium the first day? Uh-uh. The work of the Holy Spirit in restoring the people of God to a more vital spiritual life, witness and work by prayer and the word after repentance and crisis for their spiritual decline. That's a lot there. Now, let me read these, two, these three things. Renewal. When God touches the heart of a single individual. So you want revival? God, start with my renewal. Renew me. Revival. When God touches a community of faith. Starts with me. Spreads out a little bit to the community. And then the awakening. When the wider society is impacted. It spreads out. Spreads out. But it has to start. Sometimes you think you're so small. Well, what am I going to get started? The widows might. Right, Pastor Bob? Don't sell yourself short. I'm look, look at me. Do not ever sell yourself short. You were created by an awesome God. You are a masterpiece. Right. Don't you ever sell yourself short. Yeah. I don't care how bad you think your life is. Do not sell yourself short. You talking about people who say cursing God, they think it's some words. You curse God when you sell yourself short. Because he made you for his good pleasure. And he knows exactly what he's doing when he made you. Amen. 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 Some characteristics of revival. See, this is going, because you'll be ready. You've got to be ready for it. It'll, it'll overwhelm you sometimes. It raises the esteem of Jesus. Ooh, so that's what it's, ooh, it's for Jesus. It raises his esteem. Let me tell you what happens too. Satan's kingdom suffers. Because people have genuine repentance. See, genuine repentance is, I'm done with you, devil. I'm going to serve God. That's, right. that's, that's revival. That's revival. Yes. Revival. When you turn away from Satan and turn to God, that is revival. Amen. Amen. Men and women will see more clearly spiritual truth and error. Remember how you, one side or one side, how do I stay in the truth? Oh, I'll get focused right on into the middle there. Men and women will have a greater response to Scripture. Huh. When we can't figure out what we should do, maybe you should go find the Scripture that tells you what you should do. We spend a lot of money on books and DVDs and speakers and all this stuff to figure out what you should do when the scripture will tell you exactly what to do. Not bashing all that. Listen, all that's a help. It's like, it's like a helpmate. The scripture is the true helper. The, the, the Holy Spirit. The other stuff is just add-on. If you're relying on the add-on, you're missing the big picture. Okay? Calm me down, Pastor Bob. I might get wound up here. (laughs) Revival. This is good. When God intends great mercy for his people, the first thing he does is to set them a praying. Say it again. When God intends great mercy for his people, the first thing he does, he gets them a praying. 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 That's what y'all been doing. We've been doing praying. You just don't ask for revival. You pray. You pray. It's a heart that it works in you. Lord, we need revival. Lord, we desire revival. Lord, we need you to send revival. And Lord, I'm just an instrument in the thing. I just want to do my part to help revival go. And Lord, I want to be prepared for the rain when it comes. I just don't want to ask for the rain. I want to go out there and prepare the field for the rain. Right? Amen. So that's it. So we, all that ties into what are you convicted of? This country needs revival. Not just this community. This whole country needs revival. Because remember that 10%? 
that 10% has the airwaves, that 10% has every TV set, every computer screen, every iPhone, that 10% is in your children's ears 24-7. They're in our ears 24-7. And they don't think the 90% even has a mouth to speak. But how can we speak? Revival. We can get on our knees and we can pray, Lord, I'm convinced that your word is true and accurate. I'm convinced that this country is in deep need of revival, Lord. I'm convinced I need to be renewed, Lord. I'm convinced. See, when you're convinced of it, you're not going to be shaken. You're going to go for it. You know, when I used to step up to the plate and the home run was on my mind, I was convinced I was going to hit a home run. When the battle was there with Willie, I was convinced he was going back to the dugout with a strikeout. I was convinced. Did it always go my way? No, but I stayed convinced. I was convinced. When you get convicted, it takes something strong to pull you away. That's why every day we got to do something vital. Renew that mind. Every day, the renewing of the mind is vitally important. And all, all this means nothing if you don't renew that mind. See, God knows how his mind works. Why would he tell you to renew your mind if, if, he didn't know, if he knew you didn't have to? He tells you to renew your mind daily. Daily. Because he knows the strongholds. He knows the pitfalls. And he knows the glory. Why does he want you to renew your... He don't want you to renew your mind just to, to live a good life. He wants you to renew your mind so you can come live with him for eternity upon eternity. See, the goal is that his children come and live with him. Right? He sent his son to make that happen. See, we made we became his enemy. We became his enemy. That's us. We got to take our listen all from Adam. Lord, I was part of that boat, but thank God you sent a big old sail to get that boat flowing in the right direction again, and that's through Jesus Christ, the blood of Jesus. Revival revival conviction get it in your hearts get it in your mind they got to go and they got to start working together god renew me god convict me of those areas i need to be convicted of don't let influence convict me i want you to convict me let your holy spirit convict me you'll show me what i need to be convicted of i don't need to read how to do it manual by this guy down the street I need you to show me, because that's his opinion. (laughs) I want God's truth to be the guidance. So that's where we are. Remember, if you can, get that movie out, men especially, watch that courage. It will sit down to the whole family. It's just good stuff. And watch how he got convicted. A tragedy. And and then, it wasn't even the tragedy of the girl, it was how he was treating his son. And woo, that hits you in the face. You know, I got sons that I missed the mark with. So I need to watch Courageous just as a helping tool. But I know the real tool. See, the movie is a tool, but the Bible is the document, okay? That's the thing we go by. And when God shows me, hey, son, I got this tool over here I want you to go use. And it'll help you out. Because see, sometimes you, get, you can't take too much of me. So sometimes I need to get you to grab a tool to use. And you'll get some of me through that to- the use of that tool. You get it? Amen. That's why I say that. So Lord is on our side. Amen. He is truly, truly in love with his creation. Right. He knows what he's doing. Amen. And all we got to do is do our best to follow his instruction. That's, it's simple. It's not complicated. We complicate it. He doesn't. See, the world wants you to think it's too hard to follow him. And I'm telling the world, hey, you 10%, 90% beats 10% all the time. <laughs> all the time. Thank you. So we're just going to close up. Pastor Bob, I'll just say a quick prayer again. And then let you come up, say anything. I know it's getting close to time. So, Lord, we just thank you, Lord. Thank you for using me today as a tool for you. And, Lord, 
let it be imparted into my life, Lord. I heard everything I said. If no one else was here, Lord, I heard everything I said through you. And I want it to activate in my life. And Lord, anything I can do to touch other lives, thank you for that opportunity. And Lord, there's many people here that you can work through also, Lord. And Lord, any areas that they need to be just tweaked in, Lord, tweak them in that area. They're ready for you, Lord. They're open. They got the full armament to take the fiery darts, and we encourage them to keep it on 24-7, Lord. And we just thank you, Lord, that you give us wisdom, you give us understanding, you give us everything we need to get through this life, Lord. And we just continue to thank you that you bless us so richly. Sometimes we lose sight of that, Lord, but we want to repent of that right now, Lord. We thank you how richly you bless us. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you, Charles. God wants to liberate a few folks right now.